We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me also in the Zoom room. Um, thank you for joining and against all technical issues that we encountered. And on this note, thank you very much to the technical support team in Katowice who made it possible for us to hold this session right now. Um, we are at the final panel of the IFIP 60 Jubilee event series on the future of information processing. IFIP is the International Federation for Information Processing and they are this year conducting the 60th Jubilee year. My name is Elisabeth Schauermann. I, um, together with my team at the German Informatics Society, have been supporting the IFIP 60 um, Jubilee activities, and this is our our great um, uh, great final panel on the topic of the Zanzibar Declaration, which will um, which you. You will hear more about in just a minute. But the Zanzibar Declaration is on the topic of sustainable education in a digital age of rapidly emerging technologies. So something that um, really is at the forefront right now uh, when we talk about how people interact with technology. This panel is going to be moderated by Professor Don Passi and supported uh, by Johannes Magenheim. Don Passi wears many hats. Um, some of them are that he is a professor of technology enhanced learning at Lancaster University and a honorary, honorary professor of Amity University in India. He is also the current chair of IFIP's Technical Committee on Education. Over to you, Don, and I wish us all an insightful session. And if we could have the slides shared here in the room, that would also be wonderful. Thank you. Hey, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Elizabeth, that's, um, for that kind introduction. And um, hello and welcome, everyone, to, uh, to, the, to this session, um, where we're going to talk about um, an initiative that was um, set up a couple of years ago, which was to look at um, the future of education with regard to developing technologies and sustainability. Um, uh, I'm Dom Passi and Elizabeth has, has kindly introduced me and uh, I'm going to be moderating this session together with uh, Johannes Magenheim. Um, I'd also like to introduce to you the uh, four panelists, although I think I can only see three of them at the moment, but hopefully four will, will appear uh, in due course. Um, Mary Webb, who is the chair of the IFIP TC3 Task Force on the Computing Curriculum. Uh, Kathy Lewin, who's the chair of uh, IFIP TC3 Working Group 3.3. Margaret Leahy, who's the chair of IFIP TC3 WG 3.3. And also Bernard Cornu, who's a past chair of IFIP TC3. So um, you're in uh, good hands, I hope, with regard to what we're going to cover um, in, in this panel. Uh, I should also uh, say that behind the scenes, in terms of uh, the work that's gone into uh, what's going to be presented to you today, which is basically to do with the outcomes of the stage that we've reached with the Dansbar Declaration, um, I'd also uh, like to uh, mention uh, three people who've had a significant role within this uh, whole initiative. Uh, Javier Osorio, uh, who was responsible for the technical infrastructure and uh, local organizer of the uh, events that have run up to this session. Raymond Morel, who was one of the instigators of the Zanzibar Declaration that was in uh, a conference in Zanzibar in 2019. And uh, Christophe Raffay, who uh, provided organizational support um, and advice throughout the Zanzibar Declaration events. So um, I hope that I've introduced you to everyone at this point in time. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Johannes, 
uh, who is going to give you a brief uh, introduction of the process of the Zanzibar uh, Declaration and the stage that we've reached uh, at this point. So uh, if we could move the slides on to the relevant part, please. And one more. Okay, over yeah. to you, Johannes. Yeah, thanks, Don. Yes, uh, my name is Johannes Mann. I'm from the <clears throat> University of Paderborn, and I was co-moderator of all four webinars of the Zanzibar Declaration process. I'll try to give you a short uh, overview on the Zanzibar Declaration process, which has been running so far. The starting point of the process was the IFIP uh, TC3 conference on sustainable education in the digital age of rapidly emerging technologies in Zanzibar in April 2019. The conference topic is closely related to the United Nations SDG 4. Both at the conference itself and in the subsequent TC3 meeting, we discussed intensively questions of sustainable development and the influence of current and future information and communication technologies on various areas of society and the resulting demands on education. We concluded that it is necessary to initiate a process, a series of four webinars, for instance, which these contexts are further discussed and assessed concerning the future educational policy and scientific strategies of uh, the IFAPC3. The, the Zanzibar Declaration process thus focuses on the relationship between technological development in the field of ICT, its influence on different areas of society, and the resulting demands on education. In particular, how new technologies are used to support learning processes and the extent to which their basic technological principles should be made understandable to students, for example, in computer science education. In a subsequent series of four webinars, we invited experts from different TCs of the IFIT together with practitioners, decision makers, and researchers from the education sector. And we asked them to discuss specific questions on this topic areas. The following objectives and principles guided the content and organization of the webinars. You see it here on the slide. Explore future and challenges that arise from rapidly emerging technologies consider a range of topics covering recent important digital technology, their social impact and resulting educational challenges. Cover as many countries, situations, local contexts and experiences and perspectives as possible. And we say that Zanzibar Declaration will be a process that only will result in one document that will be published. The Zanzibar Declaration process should allow IFIP to identify hotspots in the area of research, computer uh, curriculum development, and future conference topics. So the webinars panelists represent diversity. We had uh, in the webinars experts from different IFIP TCs, different countries and continents, educational practitioners, decision makers, and we try to include uh, <clears throat> also gender perspectives. Please, next slide. As a basis for finding topics for these webinars, we use the matrix, which is seen here. And on the one hand side, on the left side, the various IT technologies are listed. And on the other hand, different social areas in which these technologies are applied with corresponding social effects and social impacts. We then try to identify four thematic clusters of IT and uh, social impact areas that are, of course, not entirely free of overlap, but of great interest for education. This, is a pro uh, this approach is illustrated here using webinar one as an example. Please, uh, next slide, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you. You can see the rectangles, which uh, are highlighted. Um, and you see that, uh, for instance, webinar one, which uh, focuses on social impacts of big data analysis and machine learning was related to different um, um, technological areas like big data, of course, but also machine learning, artificial intelligence, technology and recognition and so on. And on the other hand side, you see we have different areas of um, social impact like cybersecurity, privacy, social surveillance and perennity and quality of information. 
Of course, uh, <clears throat> we uh, did it in the same way for the other webinars. I, I think we don't have time to go into details here, but you can see that the other four webinars also um, had uh, thematic focuses in the intersection between technology and uh, social impact, but of course, always are focused on education issues. So webinar four was on the impact of computer networks and communication on the economic and ecological transformation of society. Webinar three um, uh, deals with ethical issues of autonomous systems and webinar four uh, at least uh, discussed power of AI methods and algorithms. And always we had education and educational perspectives in mind. Okay, the topics of all the webinars were developed in the same way, according to the same concept. And uh, I think uh, I should now turn over to the floor to Don and my co-moderators of these four webinars to open the panel discussion. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Johannes, for that uh, introduction to the to, to the process that we've gone through. Um, so I now get to the um, to the fun part, really, where I get the chance to um, to ask questions of the panel because uh, what we found from the webinars were that there were certain um, questions which were arising, really quite significant questions, I think, for the future. And um, as the panelists fortunately have had the uh, opportunity to be involved deeply in those discussions, uh, what I'm going to do is to draw out uh, some key questions and to pose these to the panelists. And I'm going to pose them to um, individual panelists and then um, ask uh, other panelists if they would um, like to respond. Um, and as uh, Mary, one of our panelists, has not yet arrived into the session, what I'm going to go, what I'm going to do is go straight to um, Kathy, if I may. And uh, Kathy, I'm going to uh, ask you a, a key question, uh, if I can. What we're, what we've been looking at is we've been looking at a range of uh, emerging applications within within these webinars, uh, such as data science, data analysis, data mining, big data, artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, machine learning. I could go on and on. I think with the uh, with the number of important emerging technologies that are arising, but. I suppose a key question is, you know, of, of all of these emerging technologies, what, what potential is there for education and particularly for teachers? You know, we hear a lot about these technologies, but what is the potential for teachers? What, how, how would you respond to that from, from your involvement in, in these events? Uh, thank you, Don. Um... I'm going to talk and respond to this question uh, from three different perspectives, from the perspective of the student, from the perspective of the teacher, and from the perspective of the institution, the educational institution. Uh, I think that, um, I mean, it's a very broad range of uh, terminology that, um, that you've mentioned there, Don. Uh, there's this huge potential for the future, and some of it is already in place in the classroom. Uh, so from the student's perspective, um, a, a big potential for personalization of learning through adaptivity, um, enabling the system to adapt to a student's um, knowledge, their level of knowledge, to, um, to pace their own learning, to access learning at any time. Um, and these systems have been around for a long time. We have had intelligent tutoring systems around for decades, but they are now much more sophisticated. So they can also uh, easily identify strengths and weaknesses and really uh, target the areas uh, of learning that a student, an individual student needs. Um, and, and, and these systems can also curate the, the learning materials and provide a unique pathway through the learning that an individual student needs. So that's a big um, advantage of these kinds of systems. Uh, in addition, there are systems that, are, that, that um, offer tutoring. So uh, either using um, natural language or um, uh, it, it, they can also um, tailor the sort of activities through uh, sensory recognition, so facial recognition, for example. So a, a very common example of that is the chatbot, um, enabling a student to interact in a, in a way as if, as if they were interacting with a human. Um, 
I have colleagues at my institution, Manchester Metropolitan University, who have been working on a system that uh, uses uh, video data to try and detect levels of comprehension in students and then to pick up on whether a student hasn't really understood the learning that they're engaging with uh, and then to, um, you know, to, 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 to uh, plot a, a pathway through the learning material accordingly or to remind them to provide them some additional practice and so on. Uh, other ways these systems can help students is in the form of guidance. So again, it might be through a chatbot enabling a student to access information about uh, timetabling, exams and so on, or uh, inquiries when they want to uh, uh, register for, a, for an institution if you're looking at higher education. Um, so access, easy access to information and responding to student questions about that. And finally, the, the, the big area um, that, that is very beneficial is the provision of feedback and assessment. So being able to provide uh, instant um, uh, responses to students in, uh, in response to the activities that they're undertaking. And that can offer them insights into their progress overall. Um, it, it can then be used to adapt the system to their areas of weakness or where they need further practice. Um, and there are other specific um, uh, uses, such as um, correcting pronunciation when you're learning a foreign language, for example. So that, that's the sort of main areas in relation to a student. And then if I move on to a teacher, um, so one of the benefits for teachers is the automation, automation of tasks. So that relates to the assessment and feedback grading of, um, uh, of pieces of work and systems have become more sophisticated and able to, um, to even make assessments of um, you know, open written ex uh, answers, so essay marking and so on. Um, so that's one area and obviously that leads to a big benefit in terms of reduction in workload and time saving. But it also um, provides the teacher in, uh, with insights about students' progress. So with learning analytics and visualisation and dashboards, they can easily see which students need particular help, which students are struggling with certain concepts and so on. So the visualisation and the learning analytics really plays a key part there. Uh, another aspect in which um, these kinds of systems are being used, it relates to supervision. So remote assessment, which obviously with the recent pandemic has become uh, more important. So enabling uh, people to undertake or students to undertake assessment remotely, but be, but be monitored. I mean, there are ethical issues in relation to this, uh, but using sensors, you can look at facial recognition. Uh, the systems can also detect keyboard strokes and so on. Uh, obviously, there's been systems around for quite a while in relation to plagiarism and cheating, but they're all, you know, developing all the time. And then behaviour management is another issue, um, which is more um, pertinent for school institutions. Uh, so there are various systems around which enable teachers to record um, behavioural incidents and then they get a, an overall picture, again, through learning analytics and dashboards to see um, you know, which students are, um, uh, are causing more problems than others. And then there are tools that um, offer seating plans, for example, for schools, uh, enab enabling, you know, that amount of data to be gathered very easily and the patterns to be uh, identified very easily. And then for teachers to be able to make those decisions about, uh, you know, where to seat the children or which, which children need more attention and so on. Uh, and then there's just more general kind of support activities. So the systems, because they're gathering so much data about students, can be used to support um, predict predictions, to analyse that data overall and to offer, as I've said before, insight for teachers to make decisions. Uh, also, these systems can um, generate content or identify content that's out there. So an another time saving aspect, um, you know, pulling that information together from across the Internet uh, into the uh, learning system that's being used. 
So finally, from a university or a school management perspective, um, again, it's about identifying lots of patterns in this data. So gathering data from all the students at the institution, uh, looking at their performance, looking at their attendance, looking at their well-being, and all of these aspects um, can be supported. So, for example, uh, in the universities, um, these systems are used to help predict and prevent student dropout. Um, and again, as I've referred to before, they can be used to support admissions, timetabling, attendance, monitoring of homework and so on. So that, that's, I mean, I have, probably haven't covered absolutely everything, but they were the things that sprang to mind when I was thinking about the uh, potential benefits of these systems in educational institutions. Thanks, Cathy. I think that that's um, a, a, a really um, useful set of, of uh, of potential that are coming out already um, from from these range of uh, applications. And this this in a way produces a very sort of positive view, I think. But it also, I think, it also pre presents a very sort of developmental view that 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 in essence we we need to be uh, aware of how things are continuing to emerge and how we're going to tackle that in the future. And I'm sure that we're going to come back to that question within within this discussion um, in 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 a range of ways. But but thank you for that starter set of ideas, which I think was 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 wonderful. That's that's a very wide ranging set. I don't know, uh, Margaret or Bernard, would you like to add anything further? Add any comments or or add any other possibilities for potential that. Um, I, I know Kathy's given us a wonderful list there, but but whether you have any more that you could offer in in response to that question, Margaret, please. Thanks, Kathy. It was actually really nice to have us pulled together like that because I think we tend to think of things in disparate ways. You know, I have this system for this. I have this system. For that but in listening through the webinars and in listening to what you said the one thing that keeps coming and thinking about it the one thing that keeps coming into my head um, is how these systems will actually complement a teacher's expertise that they're not to replace the teacher but they actually will enable us to do things in sharper and better ways and in particular i was thinking of a special needs teacher and i was a special needs teacher in formal life hmm. and as such a teacher, it takes a very long time to develop your expertise. For example, dyslexia was the area that I was working in. And while it's a common term that's bandied about, to actually learn what it is, how to deal with very specific and complex needs can take a very long time. So if back then, if I had the sophistication of the systems that are in place now, you would have help with diagnosis, you would have, help, you would have guidance as to where to from here with a particular child. It would enable you to track their progression, identify gaps, and to develop in a more in a spiral approach, possibly in a more efficient, in a quick and quicker way. Because as a young teacher, you were always struggling to find out where to, what to do, and to develop such a bank of expertise, I think would be very useful. That's my Tuppence work. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. That's 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 very very helpful. And again, it it highlights this this great need I think for us to evolve ways of sharing um, what we're what we're doing and 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 how we can do that. Um, because I'm sure that you know the examples that that both you and and Kathy have identified would have potential for many many teachers and 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 institutions. And therefore, it is a question of how, how you know, one of the questions is how, how we handle that in the future, I think, um, given the, um, the diversity of possibilities that, 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 that continue to emerge. But, but again, it's, 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 it's encouraging to hear of, of that sort of range of potential. So thank, thanks for that. I don't know whether you'd like to add anything to that, Bernard, at this point. Not, not many things, not something important, but my feeling was that uh, behind all these terms, behind all these uh, uh, concepts, uh, data analysis, data mining, and so on and so on, each of them has a strong uh, conceptual uh, content. 
And uh, these are difficult, actually, difficult uh, concepts. So how can we ask uh, teachers and learners to immediately incorporate them, include them in their uh, daily learning, daily teaching? It's a big question. So uh, but I, probably the problem is, is that I don't have the answer to this question, of course. <laughs> May, I think this is one of the, the main, the, the, the increasing difficulty of technology into education is that uh, not only technology is getting more and more complex, but the concepts of informatics, the concepts behind the technology are also more and more complex. And it, we need that people understand at least a part of them. So this is my question. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Bernard. I think that that's um, um, a very useful uh, question to to uh, to bring up, and it's certainly very key to this whole concept of sustainability. I think for the future and and how we manage that in terms of uh, sustaining not only where we are but where we're going to go. And I'm sure that we will be coming back to those sorts of questions again within this discussion. But but thank you for for bringing that up. I think that that's very very important. So now I'm going to go on, Margaret. I'm I, I I'm going to come to you and to ask you a, a, a question, another question, if I may, please, which is which to do with. Um, the, the, the growing interest that there is in, in artificial intelligence and its potential applications. And I think that we hear a lot about artificial intelligence at the moment. And some people would regard that as, um, as hype and other people would regard it as, as real opportunity and real potential and the way of the future. So, you know, from your perspective, from, from what you, you, you've you gathered in terms of, of insights from, from these uh, webinars, to what extent do you think we, we might be um, developing something here or might be thinking about developing something which is creating a reliance more on sort of outcomes and predictions from the digital systems rather are we reducing a concern for critical thinking in these respects and and i'm thinking here not just of teachers i'm thinking of students i'm thinking of managers i'm thinking of administrators what do you think with regard to that are we are we moving our our idea of critical thinking away from from the the human to the um artificial system Okay, I would say not, <clears throat> Don. And in thinking about it, I think I phrased the I kind of skewed my answer in a slightly different way. But I think in a roundabout way, it, it will come back and answer, in answer your question. And just as an aside, before I start, a colleague and I are currently developing the baseline report for the next digital strategy in Ireland. And as one of the emerging trends and something that we need to tackle in our next strategy, we have put artificial intelligence, big data, and, and so on. So it is something that we have been thinking about in the short while. But to answer your question, I think there is a danger of creating a reliance on outcomes and predictions from these digital systems. And I think that it is becoming increasingly important to develop an increased awareness and understanding of AI at all levels of education. And that was something that came through in all of the webinars. And that's so citizens, and I think particularly educators, as gatekeepers of formal education, can exercise a critical judgment in deciding how best to make use of predictive for learning analytics in education. And really, that really is of utmost importance when it comes to a school context, particularly as the majority of the people there, be it young people or or teachers or management may not have control over the data that's actually generated. So what is concerning is that on occasion schools and teachers or students or parents themselves can be providing data without properly understanding the ramifications of giving over or disclosing such data. So to prevent the creation of a reliance on or a lack of criticality, I think it's imperative that the educational sector engages in the debate, as Bernard said, as to how data and AI um, can and is to be used. And in doing so, we need to think, <clears throat> excuse me, about the need to address concerns related to data use 
and protection, privacy and ethics. In other words, who collects, controls, selects, interprets and uses the data. So I started to think of the various levels within the system. So yes, the providers and policymakers, they need to develop an overall vision and strategies on how to use technologies with regard to data. And we know that organisations such as those in the EU or the OECD are actually beginning to look at this um, currently. But most importantly, there is a need to develop teachers' understanding of the potential and challenges around the use of data and AI for teaching, learning and assessment. Teachers in particular, I think, need to understand the big ideas, in AI that is, so that they can enable their students to understand the key ideas underpinning AI, so that their students in turn can make decisions and raise issues in relation to data and the use of AI. So the key question that should be to the front and foremost in all educators' minds needs to be, do we really understand what's being measured? And more importantly, why? Okay, and then any application of AI needs careful consideration as to how, where and when human interpretation is needed. Um, one of the um, contributors in the webinars, I thought he used a very, very nice um, sentence to describe that. He talked about the importance of explainability for the recipients and social accountability for machine learning of AI systems. So there are implications then of how the AI education technology industry develops their solution. What informs how these companies develop AI applications? Now, we can say that's not a new question, that that question has always been there, that the development of, we call it new software, has always included the question of responsibility and the underlying ethical issues. And Neil Selwyn actually, in an article he wrote recently, phrased it very nicely. I'm going to read it here. He says, AI-driven education technology needs to be informed by pedagogy, with a focus on user-centered design, ensuring that teachers and students are empowered rather than marginalized by technology. So for me, what that implies is that educators should be part of the teams that develop and test AI tools to ensure that they are appropriately used in educational context and that they're underpinned by appropriate learning principles and designs. So it's necessary to understand really what the data is saying. Interpretations of the context is vital. And I think that can only be done with a variety of competencies across a range of professionals. So I hope in some way I've, I've answered your question through that. Thanks very much, Margaret. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, you know, I've I've always been concerned about these concepts of predictions because you know predictions can become self-fulfilling prophecies in 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 one sense, and I think that we have to be very very careful with regard to that. And if what we see is coming out of artificial intelligence systems is actually a prediction, rather than something which is actually asking us a question or asking us to think about this as a possibility you know i think that i think that that's a, a very um a, a very in a way concerning way to be to be going but i don't know kathy or bernard would you like to come in um fairly briefly on this kathy please yes i just want to um repeat something that margaret said earlier which is how important it is to to, to recognize these systems as being something that supports the teacher. So you don't want to rely on uh, the predictions. You don't, you know, th there needs to be some sense checking that goes on. And, and these systems are only as good as the data that they have collected. So the, the data has to be unbiased. The data has to be complete. Um, you know, so there are, as Margaret said, uh, um, there is a need for people to take responsibility for that and to ensure that, that those checks are in place with all of these kinds of systems. But going back to my first uh, sentence about the teacher, you know, using these, using these systems to support what's going on, I don't think any of us are suggesting that these systems should, should replace teachers at all. And there are lots of... Um, elements of teaching and learning that these systems are not yet able to provide 
you know more social interaction is the key one for example that's such a key part of learning when learners students c collaborate and, and interact with each other and with their teacher so yes these systems have potential but we do need to be aware of the limitations of them mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Cathy. Yes, I think I think that those are very, very useful points, and uh, it reminds me of this um, uh, of this you know concept of uh, we we do have to be careful not only about the, the the data that go in and the data that go out, but we also have to be careful about how we think about the data that come out and and whether in fact it is informing us or not. And and often we, we we can't know that unless we understand what what is at the at the background of this. So rubbish in and rubbish out, we have to be aware of. I think in 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 this instance, um, I'm I'm aware that we're 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 moving on. And what I want to make sure is that um, is that participants in this uh, event have an opportunity to also ask questions. But so I'm now going to go straight to you, Bernard, and I'm going to I'm going to um, come come and ask a, a question of you uh, directly, if I may. And this is very much to do with uh, this idea of um, of the whole concept of the Zanzibar Declaration of sustainable education in a digital age of rapidly emerging technologies, because this is. This is addressing very many different topics and concepts. It's, it, there, is, there are concerns here with regard to technology, software, resources, uh, knowledge areas, learning, teaching, pedagogy, teacher training, teacher competencies, etc. And there are clearly necessary changes and developments that, 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 that have to cons consider all of those sorts of areas. And, and in a sense, all at the same time, or how they can be integrated and worked across time. So I suppose that the question I'd like to ask you is, um, you know, from, from your insights and, and the background that you have, is it possible to deal with, with so many of these changes that, that, that need to be taken in, in, into account because they, they're involved in different ways? There are different rhythms and paces that are going on here, there, um, there's a different pace with regard to technology and with regard to teacher training, for example. How is, how is it all of this possible, do you think? Um, that's, that, that would be my question of you, please. Thank you, Don. Um, and I think this is a question for many people for a long time. I have worked with computers and ICT in education for almost uh, more than 40 years now, and I have been impressed by the time it takes to make education, to make teaching evolve, to make learning evolve, while technology evolves so quickly and asks for immediacy, rapidity. Uh, so when I first read the, the title of the Zanzibar Declaration, I had the feeling of a kind of paradox or contradiction between sustainable and rapidly emerging sustainable education, rapidly emerging technologies. Sustainable refers to a process which is stable, which needs time, which is not immediate, which lasts for long, while technologies are rapidly emerging, rapidly changing. So this leads us to the question of time, the question of pace in the changes. In the changes. And I had this question for a long time in my, in my head at least. Uh, in, in the 90s, at the end of the last century, when all education systems tried to integrate information and communication technologies into education, three issues were addressed in national policies. Equipment, the main question at the time was, in most countries, it was to provide schools with computers. Resources, educational software were developed very quickly at that time and teacher training, how to prepare and train all teachers to integrate ICT in their daily practice. Many countries uh, address these questions, these questions separately, one after the other, while some other countries, the most successful indeed, were able to address them simultaneously, in parallel. But the three issues did not develop at the same pace and this is why integration of ICT into education was so slow, so difficult. But nowadays, uh, because the evolution of technologies and of digital concepts, the question is even much more difficult. There is a kind of permanent conflict 
between the times that the rhythm technology imposes and that the time education needs. Rhythm technology and, and time education, the time of machine and the time of the human, short term, long term. Digital technologies imply and need immediacy, while education needs time, needs long time. The, the pace of informatics itself is not homogeneous. Technology evolves very quickly. New devices appear permanently. Networks lead to immediacy, instant reaction, no time for reflection. While informatics concepts develop more slowly, data, artificial intelligence, as we said a few minutes ago, privacy, even the concepts of knowledge and competencies, etc., are more slow. And in education, the, the time of the learner is, is also different from the time of the teacher. There is also a gap in the paces and rhythms between learner and teacher. Nothing new here, but uh, this needs particular strategies for teachers and being aware of that. And of course, different learners may also have different rhythms in acquiring knowledge and competencies. So the, the time of pedagogy, the time of teaching must adapt to the time of learning. Sustainable education in a digital age of rapidly emerging technologies needs many changes that will occur according to different times. The role of a teacher has to evolve and change. This needs strategies and time. The learner also has to change. For instance, he has to get acquainted to digital learning, to distance learning, to collaborative learning, etc., etc. And this needs also a particular time. Even inside schools, we have the same question. Different paces occur. The time of the classroom is not the same as the time of virtual environments. A class functions usually with periods of 50 to 60 minutes, I don't know. Virtual environments function according to more flexible times and pace. One can learn almost when he or she wants or how he or she wants. So uh, changes in education, changes in learning need also the time of a social adoption. Uh, society has to adopt this before it's really, it can be used properly. It needs acceptance from learners, acceptance from teachers, acceptance from the society. So uh, ch the change are much quicker and often precede social acceptance. They are driven, these changes in technology, mainly by economic factors, by commercial factors, by the big ICT companies, but society has also to take the time of integrate all this. And education also evolves under many other parameters, ethics, digital divide, differences at the local level, differences at the global level. This, is also, this has, has also consequences on, on time and, and paces. All the different items listed in the columns and the lines of the Zanzibar Declaration matrix have their own rhythm their own pace. In the real world, a system usually evolves or functions at the pace of the slowest component, not the quickest. So we need to be aware of the different times and to deal with them in order to master the emerging technologies and to ensure sustainable education. I think that we have to enrich the Zanzibar matrix with statements and hints about time in all the different cells of the matrix, and then to build strategies according to these times. Otherwise, technology will run faster and pedagogy will not be able to follow. Don't let technology impose its pace. So in order to answer your question, Don, yes, it is certainly possible to deal with all changes, but one must take into account the different rhythms, the different paces, the different times. Sustainable education is the main aim. Sustainable education must give the right pace to the system, to teaching, to learning, and one has to adapt technology to the pace of education and learning. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Bernard. Thank you for that uh, very, very insightful response. And uh, in a way, it sort of um, it says to me that uh, you know, in some respects, we 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 can't we can't rely upon previous models. Uh, we have to we have to rethink where we are and and where we're moving to in terms of these models because we have to understand the detail to a much greater extent 
um, perhaps than, than we've um, realized before. That, that in a sense, we've had um, a, a, an idea of a model that's been based upon this uh, non-rapid um, emergence in some respects, whereas now we have to try and find a way to look at this, which, which is going to take in so many different factors into account. So, so I, think, I think that's, that's very, very helpful. Um, Margaret, Kathy, I don't know whether you'd like to, 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 to comment briefly before, before, I, before I hand over the next part of this session to, to Johannes. Would you like to add anything um, on, on this particular issue? I think it's a very important one. Kathy? Uh, yes, it's just um, to share some of my experience, really, in relation to um, development. And it's not always it's not always moving forward. So in my experience, I've been involved in uh, research on the use of technology in schools for uh, many, many years now. And I've been to schools uh, for different projects and I've returned to schools later in time, several years later. And where the first time I went to that school, it was highly innovative, uh, you know, things were clearly developing technology was embedded across the um, educational system. You go, you can go a few years later, and then there will be a change of leadership, change of priorities, change of funding. And it's completely different. It, from my perspective, looking at the use of technology, it's it's taken a backward step. So it's it's not just about how things progress over time, but also being aware of the fact that you can you know, it, it can be it, it can regress backwards as well as move forwards. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Thanks, Cathy. That's that's that, that's very helpful. Margaret, you have a, a, a comment? Uh, yeah, just one quick observation. Um, and I agree with you, Cathy. But as Bernard and Don were talking, the word that was coming into my mind was urgency. And I just think with the advent of data or the use of data and AI at the moment, it has filtered so many aspects of our lives. And if you think of all of these algorithms that are controlling various things that we don't fully understand, or often there's kind of, you might call it an opaque uh, decision-making underpinning some of those AI processes, that I think there is an urgency to begin to understand these, um, we use a lot of terms, but I just call it AI broadly, but there is a need or an urgency for education to begin to tackle these big ideas in order that we can prepare our young people to, to succeed and thrive in the future. Thanks, thanks, Margaret. That's that that that's very helpful. And I'm 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 aware that 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 Mary has now been able to join us, which is which which is great. So so um, welcome, Mary, as the as the fourth panelist. And what I'm going to do now, um, as as you've just joined us, and I, I hope that uh, Johannes and participants will um, will be fine with this. What I'm going to do, Mary, is I'm going to I'm going to ask you a key question which follows on from what's been talked about here, if I may. Um, and I think that this follows on very, very much from, from what uh, Bernard and uh, Cathy and Margaret have been talking about with regard to uh, rhythms and paces and how things are being coped with. Um, it comes back to this, this whole idea that we, you know, we have a whole range of developing technologies that are coming on you know whether they be data science data analysis um artificial intelligence big data uh, autonomous systems etc um you know and and as bernard was saying there are there are different rhythms that are encountered with regard to these and different stakeholders are involved in different ways with regard to these but from a from an educational point of view how how do you think um, education is coping at the moment with this with this range of emerging terms and concepts that that are being brought forward? Um, what what do you feel is important here in, in terms of education in this respect for for the current and the future? Can I can I pose that that question to you, which I think comes very much from the from the discussion that we've been having? Okay, yes, thanks, Don, and sorry, everybody, um, and um, hello to everybody. I'm, I'm sorry I got stuck, I couldn't get into the system. Um, so I hope that didn't throw things too much. Um, 
Yes, so um, this this is a question that, that we've been puzzling about for um, some time, actually, in um, TC3, and also um, one that the panelists, particularly in the, in the first webinar, were um, focused on. Um, and I think everyone is agreeing that these terms are really, really important for education. Um, well, they're important for everyone, and certainly in education, we need to make sense of them. We need to make sense of the massive opportunities that um, data science and artificial intelligence will, will provide. And I think one of the, the key ideas that, that, that most people were discussing was that um, we need these things to empower teachers, but also to empower learners. Um, and, and there are various ways that that, that can happen. Um, Clearly, there are lots of opportunities already in place where um, particularly AI is being used to identify difficulties that students are having and um, to propose um, new ways that um, they might learn. Um, a lot of the systems are still um, in development. I wouldn't say that we've got very widespread use of, of AI um, certainly um, in, in the UK and probably some of the other European countries, um, in, um, particularly in schools at the moment, but there are lots of systems being developed that um, people are using in, in informal learning. There's a massive developments in China in, in this respect. So they're here already and we need to make use of these opportunities and, and be aware of the the limitations and the potential challenges that, that they provide. And I just was catching the, the end of what Margaret was, was saying there um, about the um, fact that some of these things are, are opaque. They're not transparent to, um, to the users. And, and this I think is, is one of the biggest issues that, um, that we've been um, thinking about. How do we ensure that um, people understand what is going on in the background to the extent that um, they are able to make good use of these for, for learners, for their learning, that teachers understand what's going on, but also that the learners begin to understand um, what's, what's happening when they're being advised by, by systems that are making some kind of sense of, of how they're learning and what they need to learn. So um, as well as using these systems for students to learn, we think it's really, really important that um, students start to understand um, the, the data science and the um, machine learning um, and the way in which it works, um, probably by um, using simulations. And there are um, massive developments taking place in um, new opportunities for students to, to understand the different types of machine learning by, by training systems. And Google's got one of these, but there are others as well. So I think um, that's one of the things that um, we're all suggesting needs to happen quite quickly. We need to develop our, our curricula so that um, students begin to get an understanding of how these systems can support their learning, but more generally what these systems are doing, which is going to be really important for society in the future. And there's just one other thing I'll add, um, and that is the, that the actual definitions are, are problematic because we have different definitions in, in different fields of endeavor. Um, if uh, some people only really um, are discussing what, AI does, but others need to know, well, a bit about how it works. And certainly in education, we think we need to know something about how it works, even though clearly the, the methods that machine learning is using are very complex statistical ones. And so um, it's not going to be possible for everyone to, to understand that those statistics, but they can begin to understand the implications of those. And um, the kinds of ways in which they work and the kinds of issues that they, they throw up. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. And I'm sorry I missed the first bit. I hope I wasn't repeating what people have already said. No, 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 that's, that's, that's very helpful indeed. Thanks, thanks, Mary. Thanks, thanks for those insights and for those comments and, and the response to that, to that question. Um, and I think that sort of highlights, um, you know, the, 
both the potential that we see and the challenges that we see ahead for us. And, and certainly we've, we've been able to start to discuss some of those key points um, um, with, within this session. Um, Johannes, I'm, I'm wondering, um, are there any, um, would you like to pick up in case there are any questions that would like to come from the floor, from the participants involved? Um, would you like to pick up at this point? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have any um, questions from the participants. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, if you allow, I would uh, ask a question by myself, uh, reflecting the discussions we had. I think um, we we have the opportunity in education to introduce uh, concepts of machine learning and data analysis in different school subjects, like social sciences and sciences, biology, and so on, and to, to examine um, um, questions of uh, ecology and the environmental damage, for instance. So the question is, if students and teachers are using those concepts in the different school subjects, it's really important first to look on um, transdisciplinary concepts. How can they work together in different projects to get competence from different areas together, not only from computer science and informatics, but also from other subject areas? And the other question is, to what extent is it necessary to reveal the black box, now you said it already, of um, AI methods and um, of uh, machine learning so that students will be able to understand how these concepts works and what will be the place in the curricula to um, deal with these questions? Do we, need, do we need a kind, a new kind of a subject like data science or can it be uh, done within all subjects or integrated? Or should it be, I think, a central issue of uh, computing science education? That's uh, my question. Okay, I think I think you've probably raised quite a number of questions actually there, Johannes, but but thanks thanks very much for those. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm aware that we have we have a, um, just a few minutes left, and and I'm going to invite Mary actually to 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 respond to your to your questions first, um, uh, especially because Mary has 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 been working uh, on on the task force with with TC3 in terms of the commuting curriculum, and I think that that would be very very relevant. Um, so if you don't mind, Mary, I, I, I maybe ask if you could respond to that first within literally a couple of minutes, please. OK, yes. So I think the black box issue um, is, is really, really important. And the black box issue is, is the fact that um, explanations from AI systems, from systems that are using machine learning, particularly the kind of deep learning that um, is, is being developed very rapidly these days are very difficult to, to achieve. And so very often the explanations are built um, on top of um, the system. They're not actually able to, to go to explain exactly what's going on, if you like, in, in the background. Um, and sometimes they're not totally accurate. So one of the issues for education is, do we say that we will only allow um, AI systems that um, can provide proper explanations? Do, do we allow these black boxes in education? Because there are other ways that machine learning can work. Um, but some of the more sophisticated applications that are being developed depend on, um, on these, these black boxes. And I think a lot of people are saying we must make certain that the, the explanations can be completely transparent. Um, so, uh, yes, I think we, we do need to be very aware of that, and we probably need to actually um, set some limits as to um, what people will, will do with um, these machine learning systems, and make sure that the um, explanations are coming through in a way that's not just accessible to teachers, but to learners also. And that's going to require some visualization techniques, some ways of presenting the, the data, um, I'll stop there. I've probably had my time. Thanks, Mary. Um, Margaret or, or Kathy, uh, again, in response to that question, you, you, do, are you, would you like to make a comment of literally one minute of, 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 of comment if, if, you, if, you, if you'd like? Or, or Bernard? Just one sentence. Uh, there are more and more black boxes in education and technology. 
if we if we want to use these boxes, people must be confident in these black boxes. And to be confident, in order to be confident, we must train them to reflect, to have a minimum understanding, to have a certain knowledge, not of all the content, but just a minimum for being confident. Social networks are not enough for that. <laughs> Thank you, Bernard. I think that that's a very, very, um, a very, very uh, nice comment to be to be finishing on here. And I suppose the other comment that I would I would like to to offer at the end here is it does seem to me that we are becoming more and more reliant upon networks and networking. And I wonder to what extent we we actually have uh, developed that for the benefit of all at, at this stage would would also be um, a, a comment that I that, that that I would add. So at this point, um, can I can I think thank you all for participating? Uh, can I thank the organisers of the of the Zanzibar Declaration events and the panelists and moderator and uh, the IFIP sixty organisers who've been involved behind the scenes on this? Thank you very much and to uh, IGF for their support, and particularly to thank all of the participants who've been involved. So thank you very, very, very much for uh, a, a very useful and enjoyable session. Thank you.